This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. In the previous video last week, we looked at an interesting case of a major navigational error in where the flight crew of a plane inadvertently flew off course into restricted airspace and was shot down. In this video, we should take a closer look at another instance of a navigational error, an error which is, to put it simply, baffling. Two pilots flying a Boeing 737 in northern Brazil were to perform a short regional route, which was the final leg of a long journey across the country. Varig Flight 254 seemed to vanish without a trace. Judging by the plane's route that evening, search and rescue teams could not seem to find the plane for days. It was as if the plane simply vanished. Where the plane was actually located compared to where it should have been brought a lot more questions than answers and the reason as to why this happened is truly baffling. For days the plane was lost. The incident of Varig 254 not only demonstrates a navigational error with fatal consequences, but also a demonstration of human survival. We'll learn more about this accident after a brief word from our sponsor. I want to thank Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. Surfshark is a VPN which is fast and easy to use, install and can be run on unlimited devices with a single subscription. It's full of features that go way beyond the basics, so let's break it down. There is a lot of online content out there on all kinds of websites. Some places want to take and collect your information without you even knowing, compromising on your security. Surfshark secures your data with industry-leading measures, providing IP and DNS leak protection, and maintains a strict no-logs policy, so that no one can find where you're connecting from. I am using a VPN whenever I use the internet these days for this very reason, but that's not all. My favorite feature of Surfshark is the fact that you can consume content that normally is not available in your country by unblocking content on most platforms. For me, in the work that I do, I know that there are some videos right here on YouTube that would be of particular interest for me, but is normally hidden behind a region lock. Surfshark gives me that level of freedom to bypass these locks. Connect to a server in Japan and unlock Japanese Netflix or any one of their other libraries. Get access to BBC iPlayer, Hulu, and other limited streaming services. Maybe you travel a lot. Overcome location-based price discrimination on plane tickets and car rentals. Don't get locked out of your bank account. Be safe on public Wi-Fi and reach your favorite sites and services anywhere in the world, even in countries that ban them. With a 30-day money-back guarantee, Surfshark is doing a limited time offer. By using the link in the description and entering promo code Disaster Breakdown, you'll get 83% off and four extra months for free. You really can't get a better deal than that right now. A big thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. The day was September 3rd, 1989. A Boeing 737 was making a long journey from Sao Paulo in Brazil to the northern town of Belém. It was a long day for the flight crew who left the city of Sao Paulo at 9.43 in the morning for the 8 hour and 20 minute flight to Belém. The trip would normally not take this long on a direct route, but flight 254 along the way made 6 stopovers. The first leg of the trip was to Uberaba, following on from there were stopovers in Uberlandia, Goiânia, Brasilia, Imperatriz, and the final stopover before the leg to Belém was in the city of Maraba. The accident in question occurred on the final leg between Maraba and Belém. The flight up to Maraba went smoothly with no reported problems. The pilots flying this long route in the 737 that day included 32-year-old Captain Cesar Augusto Padula Garces. He became an airline pilot in 1982. Over the years, he had spent time flying Boeing 727s, Lockheed Electras, and various military aircraft. By the time of the accident, he had been flying the 737 for just one year, having moved to the plane in April of 1988. That day, his co-pilot and first officer was 29-year-old Nelson de Souza Zile. He became an airline pilot in 1984. Like his captain, he too had experience on other planes before becoming a 737 pilot. Flight 254 arrived in Maraba at around 5 p.m. During the turnaround, some passengers left the plane and some joined for the flight to Belém. Cargo would also have been altered accordingly. During the turnaround, First Officer Zile was outside performing an external walk-around check of the plane, whilst Captain Garces was on the flight deck reading over the flight plan for their final leg of the day. 
The brief basically instructed the pilots to fly a specific heading towards Belém. In due time, the plane would pick up a radio signal from the airport. From there, the pilots would be guided to Belém. As a good jumping off point into understanding why this accident is so mystifying, we should know where the plane ended up, and from there, we can delve deeper into understanding how things went wrong. This was the plane's route, and here is where it ended up. Somehow, Flight 254 ended up over 600 kilometers southwest of Maribor, in pretty much the opposite direction the plane was supposed to fly. So what happened? How did the flight crew get this so very wrong? To put it bluntly, the captain had misinterpreted a key piece of information in the flight plan, but let's dive deeper into what that information was. The airline the captain worked for, Varig, had at the time recently changed how it displayed heading information on flight plans. The change was to now display heading across four digits, which is highly unusual in and of itself. The fourth digit was supposed to be a decimal. For example, if a flight plan said to fly at 115 degrees, in this format, it was printed and supposed to be interpreted as 115.0 degrees. The decimal point was missing, or rather just not included at all when these flight plans were printed. This change to a four-digit decimal format was made whilst Captain Garces was on a scheduled vacation break. With that in mind, imagine for a moment that you had just come back from your vacation and see in your flight plan the value of 0270 as the heading you needed to fly to get to your destination. How would you interpret this? Captain Garces had mistakenly interpreted it to mean a heading of 270 due west, when in fact it was intended to mean 027.0 degrees. The captain had read through this brief during the turnaround in Maribor while his first officer was performing the walk around. When the first officer returned, he copied the captain's side heading instrument to read the same heading of 270 instead of reading from his own flight plan as he was supposed to. The flight crew took off from Maribor at 5.45 p.m. and flew west instead of north-northeast towards Belém like they should have. Flight 254 climbed up to 29,000 feet without the crew suspecting a thing. On board were 48 passengers and 4 flight attendants on top of the pilots. The flight to Belém should only have been around an hour in length. As the plane flew further and further away from their intended flight path, the passengers on board began to worry. Some even notified the flight attendants that they were going the wrong way. However, the attitude of, the pilots know what they're doing, prevailed and the flight attendants did not forward the passengers' observations to the pilots. So the misinterpreted heading information explains why the plane flew west, but how did it fly south for several hundreds of kilometers? To explain this, we should move to the moment when Flight 254 attempted to contact Belém Tower for their arrival. At the time, radar coverage over the sparsely populated area of Brazil was limited or non-existent so the plane was not tracked by radar from controllers in both Maribor and Belém. The crew of Varig 254 were not only navigating with heading printed on their flight plan, but also a piece of equipment that would roughly measure how far they had travelled. This was the older model of the 737, it did not have the sophisticated technology of the plane today. The plane was supposed to pick up the signal sent out by Belém Airport's VOR. It was the first officer, who noticed that the plane had not picked up the VOR, even though the plane was tuned into it. There was also no response from the tower when the pilots initially tried to contact them. Contact with Belém Tower was established once using a higher frequency, longer range radio. Flight 254 requested a send down to 4000 feet, and the controller gives the clearance. However, as the plane descended, as the pilots thought they were approaching their destination, there was no city of Belém no airport, and no recognizable landmarks. For a time, the crew believed that they had actually passed the airport, and so made a 180 degree turn, but still no airport and no city to be found, just countryside and rainforest. The pilots should have been able to see recognizable landmarks, but then they come up with an unconventional improvision to try and find the city of Belém. They tuned some of their other radio equipment into the range of commercial radio stations. 
local stations in Belém, Radio Liberal, and Radio Guajara were able to be picked up. As it turned out, that evening, there was a major Football World Cup qualifying match being broadcast on the radios. In theory, the pilots could follow the radio signal to Belém. They made a big assumption that the radio signal was coming from Belém. When they followed it, it actually took them south. As they made their turn to the south, as the accident report details translated from Portuguese, the general heading to the south was maintained by the markings of two radio stations, supposed to be Radios Liberal and Guajara, which coincided with the general heading of a river, facts that meant for the pilot to be on the correct course for Belém. They were, in fact, not on the correct course for Belém, and were now flying away from it, further than they already were. Though the plane had descended to 4,000 feet as per ATC clearances, there was nowhere for the plane to land. The stakes were raised higher as by now, the plane was long overdue in Belém and fuel starvation was now of concern. It was apparent to the flight crew that they had made a terrible mistake. Believing they were now somewhere they actually weren't, the pilots began deciding on diverting to a different airport. Captain Garces suggests the airport at Santarem, but even this was nowhere near their position. Passengers in the cabin were getting worried. The plane should have already landed and even passengers, locals to Belém, did not recognize the view outside. It would also appear to the pilots that their navigational equipment had picked up some kind of frequency similar to that of Maraba Airport, the place they had departed from. They reported to air traffic control that they had a track of 175 for Maraba, when in fact, what they had actually picked up was a VOR in Goiania. The two airports shared the same frequency at the time. The pilots climbed up to 8,000 feet. The time that evening was now 8.40 p.m. when Captain Garces informed air traffic control of their forced landing intentions. When it was estimated that the plane had just 15 minutes of fuel remaining, the captain informed the passengers of the situation and that a forced landing was inevitable. The plane ran out of fuel just minutes later, with the left engine given out first, followed by the right. Varic Flight 254 then made a crash landing in the Amazon rainforest. For two days, the plane was missing. 42 out of 54 occupants had actually survived the crash. Among the survivors were both pilots. It's an interesting tale of human survival in a dense rainforest, as the average airline passenger likely does not know how to survive in this kind of environment. The plane wouldn't be found until after a small group of passengers set off into the Amazon rainforest in search of help. Those survivors happened to stumble across farms, who were able to put them in communication with investigators and the Brazilian Air Force. Once the plane was located, food packages were dropped to the remaining survivors at the crash site. It would take a further two days to rescue all the remaining passengers, including the pilots. In total, 12 people were killed in Varig Flight 254. Following the investigation into the incident, it was found that the plane was lacking significantly in navigational equipment. The plane had not even been fitted with an inertial navigation system, which was commonplace at the time. Pilots only navigated with the use of ground-based radio aids. The airline, Varig, made the necessary changes to their flight plans. This included adding in that missing decimal point. Radar coverage in Brazil was expanded to account for the entire country, and Varig installed newer navigational equipment on board their planes. Both pilots involved in Flight 254 were initially sentenced to four years in prison. This punishment, however, was dropped to community service. Hello everyone, I hope you are having a good day wherever you are and whenever you watch this. Thank you so much for watching. If you found this video to be interesting, let me know what you thought in the comments and be sure to subscribe as there is always a new video every Saturday. I know last week I alluded to a long project that I'm working on. I obviously don't want to spoil what the video is about at the moment as it is still in the writing phase and will be a very big video. All I will say is that I have stepped into a deep rabbit hole that goes back over 50 years in aviation and I certainly found it very interesting. There was a video I made in recent months where this very dark, deep pit of seemingly no end presented itself, and yeah, I've gotten sucked down it. 
No estimate on a release just yet, but it will most likely be a midweek video in addition to the weekly content, as I'm just working on it in the background. Anyway, I want to take a moment to thank my patrons over on Patreon for their continuous support. If you would like to have your name featured here or read out at the end of the next video, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from £3 per month and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. Patrons also get early access to all new videos 48 hours before they go out publicly on YouTube. So a thank you to my £5 tier patrons, Avery Teoda, Hunter Heilman, Hector Palmatellas, Joey, John Ambrosia, Ken Zachman, Kenneth Morins, Christy, Leon St. Jennings, Marie Innes, MG, Mom Left Me at Best Buy, Pacman 7, Panic Chicken, Pedro Cruz, Rebecca Rivers, Rez, Rio Whitley, Surya Melody, Sleepy, So FP, Sue 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 Shoes, and Tristan Kriegsman. Thanks to my £10 tier patrons for the generous support. We also have a couple of new people joining this list this week. So a thank you to Ada Montgomery, Anne Sid, Bard Ghost Isu, Derek Bean, Erin Wilson, Espalon, Extreme Brooklyn Accent, James Bluke, Karma, Megan Garrick, one of the new joiners, Mike Milton, Roger Mayer, Steve Cottrell, Thick Coconut, also a new joiner, Vapramva, and Where Are My Cheetos. Thank you all so very much. And that is it for me this week. I hope you have a good weekend, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.